So imagine AI blows into all these other sectors where it's still relatively small and thousands and thousands of companies pop up and you happen to be a proficient developer. I think that's a good thing. And then imagine if you have basic grounding in language models or machine learning, that's even better. And then add the fact that you're very proficient in a programming language like Python. What's up everybody? It's Travis here from Travis.media. Today, I'm gonna give some examples of what future AI programming jobs might look like. Now we're all thinking that AI is gonna take all the jobs, but I think it's gonna create many opportunities that we don't know about yet. And yes, I think there will be jobs for devs like us still. Being a technical person will be a baseline requisite and you'll have that skill to build on. And today I wanna to play two clips from a talk that I really enjoyed from an expert on the matter about the potential for AI in all the other sectors that haven't really been touched yet. Then I wanna discuss the implications, how you may wanna start preparing early for these opportunities. And then I wanna finish the video on Python, why it's at the forefront of all this, and then provide you with a free blueprint that will take you from A to Z. Let's get started. So a huge opportunity right now in this industry is AI as a general purpose technology in the very diverse use cases that are starting to exist right now. The speaker here is a globally recognized leader in AI by the name of Andrew Ng. I'm not gonna try to pronounce it, but the whole talk is fascinating. He's a fascinating guy. So there's this graph here, and on the left we have the big leaders. We have the ads, the web search, e-commerce, product recommendations, the big money and spotlight right now is in this tech world, in consumer software internet world, but not really yet into the rest of the economy. As you go down this curve, there presents the rest of all the sectors that AI really hasn't impacted yet, which is way bigger than just tech and consumer software. So I'm gonna play this first clip, which gives some examples of future projects on the smaller scale. And it turns out that about 10, 15 years ago, you know, various of my friends and I, we figured out a recipe for how to hire, say, 100 engineers to write one piece of software to surf more relevant ads and apply that one piece of software to a billion users and generate massive financial value. So that works. Um, so real quick, just for context, what he's saying is that previously with ad solutions and such, you have a billion users with which you can write one piece of software for. You can hire a hundred developers that will write the software in you're rich. But once you go out into smaller industries, you don't get this model anymore. It gets more specific and smaller and the high cost of customization no longer makes sense. And that's where we head down this curve into the other sectors. But once you go outside consumer software internet, hardly anyone has a hundred million or a billion users that you can write and apply one piece of software to. So once you go to other industries, as we go from the head of this curve on the left over to the long tail, these are some of the projects I see and I'm excited about. I was working with a pizza maker that was taking pictures of the pizza they were making because they needed to do things like make sure that the cheese is spread evenly. So this is about a $5 million project, um, but that recipe of hiring 100 engineers or dozens of engineers to work on a $5 million project, that doesn't make sense. Um, <clears throat> or there's another very example, working with an agriculture company that um, with them we figured out that if we use cameras to find out how tall is the wheat, and wheat is often bent over because of wind or rain or something, and if we can chop off the wheat at the right height, then that results in more food for the farmer to sell and is also better for the environment. But this is another you know, $5 million project that that old recipe of hiring a large group of high school engineers to work on this one project, that doesn't make sense. Um, and similarly, materials grading, cloth grading, sheet metal grading, many projects like this. So whereas to the left, in the head of this curve, there's a small number of, let's say, multi-billion dollar projects, and we know how to execute those, you know, delivering value. In other industries, I'm seeing a very long tail of tens of thousands of, let's call them $5 million projects, that until now have been very difficult to excuse on because of the high cost of customization. What he's getting at is that now, based on all the work that people have done in AI, this is possible. The aggregate work that's been done allows these smaller, more niche solutions to be done with the creation of no code or low code tooling. The trend that I think is exciting is that the AI community has been building better tools that lets us aggregate these use cases and make it easy for the end user to do the customization. So specifically, I'm seeing a lot of um, exciting low code and no code tools that enable the user to customize the AI system. What this means is instead of me needing to worry that much about pictures of pizza, um, we have tools, because we're starting to see tools that can enable the IT department of the pizza making factory to train an AI system on their own pictures of pizza to realize this $5 million worth of value. 
And by the way, the pictures of Pisa, you know, they don't exist on the internet. So Google and Bing don't have access to these pictures. Uh, we need tools that can be used by really the Pisa factory themselves to build and deploy and maintain their own custom AI system that works on their own pictures of Pisa. So here's where I'm going with this and where he's going with it. You have this pizza company that wants to use AI for pizza food inspection. It's a $5 million project. You don't take the same model that you took with all the previous stuff where you get billions of users, create this one major solution and sell it to all the users. This is a much smaller case. In AI and the tools we have now, now allow for us to start moving into these sectors. For example, he had talked earlier about sentiment analysis and how they used to put all that together. Now with OpenAI, you can just say, act as a sentiment analysis and it'll do so. So we have this basic AI tooling available for these projects now. So this company, this pizza company would benefit from a low code or a no code solution that they can use to do their work. So imagine a team of devs in the pizza IT department who would write the code, they take the data, they take the images of the pizza from the company and train a model and then build out a no code system for the company to use, or maybe they would maintain it for the company. Or say you're a contractor or you own an AI consulting firm that would build out these solutions for the companies in any companies who'd come your way. It will consist of AI engineers, as well as application developers who add in all the other functionality enabling end users or business departments to send in human readable prompts. Perhaps you'll be a dev at that company. Perhaps that tool will be more generic and be pushed out to the entire food industry or pizza industry and then competitors will come. So there's a lot of opportunities to be realized in this general purpose technology. The tech and consumer industry is small compared to all the other sectors out there that haven't really found benefit in AI yet. He also gets into the importance of building many new companies companies that focus on all these particular sectors individually. Imagine the opportunities then. Another example he gave is his team is building out a new app called like Amore AI or Amorei or something like that, where they're working with the CEO of Tinder, the dating app, to get relationship data and his app will provide relationship coaching or something like that, but it bridges AI in relationships. That's a sector that hadn't been explored yet. Another one he mentions is Bearing.ai, which is making ships fuel efficient. So it's like Google Maps, for ships to save like 10% on all fuel costs. So imagine AI blows into all these other sectors where it's still relatively small and thousands and thousands of companies pop up and you happen to be a proficient developer. I think that's a good thing. And then imagine if you have basic grounding in language models or machine learning, that's even better. And then add the fact that you're very proficient in a programming language like Python. Now I wanna discuss briefly Python. All these AI researchers are using Python. Even in this video, he gives this example in Python within a Jupyter notebook. Because currently Python is the choice language for machine learning and data analysis in all things in this broad field. Why is that? Why not C or C++? Well, because Python has libraries and frameworks that make machine learning and data analysis in the surrounding ecosystem easier. Packages like NumPy or Matplotlib or Pandas are very, very popular. Also, because many of the people doing AI research, they're not traditional developers. They need a tool to help them in their AI research, and Python is an easy one to pick up and run with. And to add to this, most of the Python tools, like TensorFlow, actually uses C++ in the background, making it very performant. Other packages use C, so you could learn C++ and be one of the real game changers in the background. This is a great pursuit, but it's a hard one, because you could, more quickly, become really, really good at Python and just run with that. Python is what you can use on top of C and C++ without having to know these more challenging languages. Now I'm not saying that knowing Python makes you an AI engineer, of course not, but all of these apps are being built with it or around it. Knowing it well, will go a long way in the coming years. In addition, where are all these trained models being deployed when they're ready to go? Well, in the cloud somewhere. Azure has a great solution for this. And here's a tip you don't have to go down the traditional web dev route. You don't have to learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I think there's a legitimate pathway from scratch to start out with Python and while becoming proficient with it in other industry standards like Git, become cloud certified. So much so that I've created a free, completely free blueprint that will take anyone starting out from scratch through learning Python and other industry level tools and getting a legitimate cloud certification along the way from start to finish all the way to job ready. And it's completely free. I'll put a link to it below. So what do you think about all the opportunities? What do you think about Python? Let me know down below. Let's have a discussion. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing to the channel and I'll see you in the next video.